I'm going to introduce the next speaker, who is John Bingley, who's going to talk to us about the Constitution. He has modified a talk that he normally does in order to focus on today's topic. Uh, give him a round of, of applause, please. Uh, but we need to get going. <laughs> Hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be here. I'll try and speak clearly. Um, I know the acoustics in here don't seem to be particularly marvellous, but uh, we'll do our best for you. Um, I'm a layperson, as you gather, who's uh, been studying the Constitution now for far too long. Um, I've got a letter that you'll see that was written in 2000, um, and uh, we're going back before that. Um, I started this whole uh, thing because I was a pistol shooter and I used to uh, make uh, ammunition or uh, bullets for reloading pistol shooting and uh, my business was uh, in effect closed down without any compensation um, when the ban on pistol shooting came about and um, so I didn't think that matched with the constitutional position as I knew it and so I started looking into the constitution and uh, that's how I've come to be here. Uh, my journey's been uh, quite an interesting one. Um, I've given, uh, I met the late Norris McWhirter, um, one of our leading constitutional QCs, um, Leland Price QC, um, CBE, um, and I've given a constitutional uh, presentation that I have, uh, both to audiences of the uh, constitutional group, and uh, it's been seen in Strasbourg and in Westminster and in Washington. So it's uh, been taken around and it's also been shown to some extremely important people in terms of uh, high offices um, privately um, who said, well, it's extremely hard hitting when you see it all put together like that, but then seem to ignore it. So uh, enough about the background, that's where we are. Um, that's who I am, I am just a layman. And uh, so the first thing is, if we're going to talk about the rule of law, um, what do we mean by the rule of law? Is it uh, just something that uh, Parliament can make up and everyone else obeys? Does the rule of law apply to Parliament itself? Is, it is any of it constitutional in as much it should control and limit the powers of Parliament? Um, if you write to politicians today, they will tend to say that um, that's not the case and they, Westminster can do as it likes. Um, provided that they can get a democratic vote. And that implies, therefore, that there aren't any bits of hard limitation um, that we can come up against. And so that's what I've been trying to explore, to see where the limits and boundaries are. And Leolin Price, the QC, said, well, yes, there are boundaries, but nobody seems to know where they are. And uh, you seem to be doing a good job of trying to clarify it. Well done, keep on with it. And uh, so there we are. So, just thinking about the rule of law in the very first place, the picture up there is of Bosom Harbour, and you can see the church spire in the middle there. And that's where King Canute's daughter is buried. Um, and it may be, well be the place where King Canute um, attempted uh, to turn back the tide. For those of you who have uh, heard the tale, how he sat on the shore and was told that he was such a great uh, king by his, uh, his advocates um, that the tide wouldn't wet his feet. And um, it's said that... Uh, he, he agreed to have his throne by the, the tide and get his feet wet because he had to show them that uh, this wasn't really the way of kings and that he was actually a, a, a quite a decent chap. Anyway, so that was a, a nice picture of Bosom and that's why that's there. Fast forward from Canute a couple of hundred years and we come up to Magna Carta, which was a first formal attempt to get our law into some sort of written shape. Um, that is one of the copies held at Salisbury Cathedral up there. Um, and it was there, uh, an agreement that was imposed upon uh, King John, as most of us know. And uh, he wasn't, uh, in theory, to disobey it. Of course he did. Um, but it has been reasserted, I believe, over 30-odd times um, through our history. So it, it has teeth. Um, it said that in the last result, uh, resort, um, if the crown doesn't come back uh, to the way of the constitution, there is a right of resistance. 
Um, so that was to give teeth to it, and um, it was a formalized, you had to get the agreement of uh, 25 barons, and then you could, you could carry out a lawful rebellion, um, an armed rebellion, but you must desist as soon as you got remedy and redress. Um, so that was the principle. The principle was the law was there to be obeyed with the right of resistance, and that uh, above all, um, you would be tried by your peers. Um, and that, of course, is terribly important to us today. So it's the beginnings of our jury system. Now we move forward again through history to 1688. It's very good to have a little time machine like this. Um, but many of you will know that there was a revolution, the glorious revolution of 1688, um, in which William and Mary came to the throne. It's not covered much by our history books, um, and you, it's, it's extraordinary to me, having researched it, why not? Um, and uh, it has a, a very significant um, point in time. Uh, there was a revolution. It was basically peaceful. There was a battle at, at Reading. About 100 people were killed. Um, and William and Mary came to the throne. They had a right to the throne. James had been abusing his power. Um, William came over, having been invited to come over arguably in line with the terms of resistance from the Magna Carta, um, to put things right. He came with a, a about 13,000 soldiers. Um, James had 25,000, but William had been told that many of them would defect, um, which is immediately what happened. Um, he came over and he took charge. And he then said, well, how do you want to settle affairs? And it was agreed that a convention would assemble um, which was elected, um, duly elected and assembled, and um, they came up with a document called the Declaration of Rights. And the Declaration of Rights was then formalized um, and read to William and Mary, and uh, that is a painting of it being read to the Crown, uh, sorry, to William and Mary, and you can see the clerk on the left there with the document, and um, it was read before passing the Crown, and they asked William and Mary to agree to its terms, which they did, and their terms were subsequently written onto it uh, and endorsed uh, by the parliamentary clerk. Um, that document I have got out and researched myself is one of the first things that I did when I started looking into it. So it's been a very interesting, as I say, journey for me. Um, what then happened was that William and Mary did come to the throne. Um, a coronation was required. Um, they decided that they would enact a bill to call the, well, make an enactment, of, which we now know as the Bill of Rights, um, which in fact is the Declaration of Rights, plus some additional text. But if you read it, it starts off and tells you that things have gone wrong, um, there is to be a Declaration of Rights. Here it is, it said 13 things James had been doing wrong, 13 remedies, um, and here it is. And knowing that people would try and uh, doubt it in subsequent years, um, they in put it into a formal document to make it a statute as well. So you have the Declaration of Rights, which is cited by the Bill of Rights. So the Declaration is the actual contract that the Crown engaged in and was handed over by, and the Bill of Rights is the subsequent recognition of that by a statute um, made in a normal course of events as they could get it. And there are the two documents, um, and uh, you can see I'm holding here on the you're right, the uh, Declaration of Rights itself, and there the statutory version of it, the Bill of Rights, to um, our left. William and Mary obviously needed uh, to have a coronation, and it was realized that things had gone wrong because the divine right of kings that James had been practicing had uh, blown away the rule of law, and uh, the idea was that the divine right meant he could do as he chose, to some extent at least. So we had changes to the coronation oath at the time, and an enactment was made, and this is the preamble to it. And it's quite interesting because it says, whereas by the laws and ancient usages of this realm, the kings and queens thereof have taken a solemn oath upon the evangelist at their respective coronations to maintain the statute laws and customs of the said realm, and all the people and inhabitants thereof in their spiritual and civil rights and properties. So that, in effect, outlines the purpose of our government, what the very fundamental outline. And 
what they did is that they added words into it, which were the statutes in Parliament agreed on. The king had to now agree that that was in the oath and to swear to it, so that they could no longer dismiss the statute law. So those words were added into the oath, and that's where they are, according to the statutes in Parliament agreed on and the laws and customs of the same. And those words really have set the whole of the British Empire and the free world afoot, because they really started a place permanently and undeniably the rule of law uh, into our legal system. Um, so the divine right of kings was really killed off by them. Now, the glorious revolution is frequently portrayed by parliament uh, or parliamentarians and civil servants and so on as a victory for passing power to parliament. Um, well, strictly speaking, it didn't do that. Um, what had happened is that the king, uh, the, the Stuart kings, had been abusing their power. And so what we have was uh, this text here from the Bill of Rights, a uh, wonderful bit of text, um, shows that all the power that the crown had rightfully was fully transferred. Um, and to whose princely persons the royal state, crown, and dignity of the said realms, with all honors, styles, titles, regalities, prerogatives, powers, jurisdictions, and authorities to the same belonging and appertaining are most fully, rightfully, and entirely invested and incorporated, united and annexed. Well, there you have it. There's not much left out there. So the, the crown had all the powers that it had rightfully beforehand. Um, and there are those words, a little more easy to see there. Um, so this was the point of the glorious revolution. And so therefore it was a victory in effect for the supremacy of the law. Um, that's what it did. It, it created the supremacy of the law. Um, but it didn't actually create um, a supremacy of parliament as such. Come forward again to 1988. And of course, we celebrated the 300-year tercentenary um, by printing, or minting rather, um, silver um, two-pound coins um, with the Bill of Rights on, which you can see there. And there was a Scottish version of our Bill of Rights um, made called the Claim of Rights, and uh, one was done for the Scots as well. Um, at that, there was a meeting of, uh, held in Westminster of all, all the heads of state of the Commonwealth and so on to celebrate it, and the Queen made a speech, and these are the words of that speech, or an excerpt from it. Experience has taught that the peoples can enjoy the full fruits of liberty, security, and justice only when they are represented in a sovereign legislature whose laws are interpreted by an independent judiciary. The Bill of Rights and the Scottish Claim of Rights, 1689, still part of the statute law, are the sure foundation on which the whole edifice of parliamentary democracy rests and has great influence abroad, especially in the United States of America and in the Commonwealth. So there you can see the Queen herself has regarded this as the sure foundation. Um, the Bill of Rights had specified the Protestant succession of the throne, but um, what happened is it ran out, and so an act of settlement was made because of the death of uh, one of uh, uh, um, Queen Anne's sons um, died, and uh, she had 17 children, um, but the, the survivor of them died at his 11th birthday, poor lad. And so the act of settlement was made, and it is by this enactment that the House of Hanover um, has its authority on the throne, um, which of course is Windsor. Um, and so the Act of Settlement connects both the throne with the uh, religion, the Protestant religion, um, and determined the line of uh, the Protestant line of the, of the throne continuing. Now, the, all this was contractual, was recognized by one of our great lawyers. Um, who wrote some wonderful constitutional books, Sir William Blackstone, and he put it in very plain terms, which is really nice. However, in what form it so ever be conceived, this is most indisputably a fundamental and original express contract. And to reduce that contract to a plain certainty, so that whatever doubts might be formally raised by weak and scrupulous minds about the existence of such an original contract, they must now entirely cease, especially with regard to every prince who has reigned since the year 1688. So you can see that 
these documents were regarded as the be-all and end-all of the fundamentals of our Constitution. So having got that, um, there is Elizabeth and her father's uh, coronation oaths, um, which you can see Elizabeth's on the right there. And we'll move on. I then wrote back in 2000 to my MP and um, asked that uh, could uh, ministers uh, advise a breach of the coronation oath because they seem to say they can do what they like. So how about telling the Queen to breach her oath? That seemed to me that that would be going too far. And of course it secures your and my and everybody else's liberty. And that's the purpose of it. So back came the reply after it got delegated from Blair's office to Straw. Um, the coronation oath, uh, I'm replying in light of my constitutional responsibilities. It's funny how Mr. Blair had to delegate that. Um, every MP should know this absolutely inside out. Anyway, I can confirm that the coronation oath is a solemn undertaking by the sovereign and is regarded as binding throughout her reign. Her Majesty would not be advised uh, to give her assent to a provision which contradicted that oath. Uh, yours ever, Jack. Um, so that was that. Well, we'll move on again. I'm sorry that this is having to throw this through at quite a pace here, um, but I've got a very tight schedule to get this through for you. Um, and this is the Privy Councillor's Oath of Office. And uh, that demands that you will, to your uttermost, the black words at the, in the middle there, uh, bear faith and allegiance unto the Queen's Majesty. Well, the Queen's Majesty, of course, is the... Uh, the, the, the state, it's the, the whole regal thing. It's not Her Majesty the Queen, it's not the doff cap. When you're uh, being polite to the Queen, you're in effect being polite to the state, to the Constitution. That's the dignity royal. Uh, and will assist and defend all jurisdictions, preeminences, and authorities granted to Her Majesty and annexed to the Crown by Acts of Parliament or otherwise against all foreign princes, persons, prelates, states, or potentates. Well, that was intended to preserve our sovereignty. Well, we know how that's been dismissed, but yet that, if you go to the Privy Councillor's Oath of Office, that's what they swear up to. Um, so that's interesting. The next one is the House MP's Code of Conduct, and you'll see there that, a uh, very similar thing, they have a duty to bear true allegiance according to law, a duty to uphold the law, uh, and uh, in accordance with the public trust placed in them. Well, those are interesting words, aren't they? Um, does that put some obligation on them? Um, now then, if you, next one was Parliament's very own handbook, um, Erskine May. I had to go back to a th uh, 13th edition. They're on about 20, I think, now. And this bit is virtually non-existent now. It disappears in about the 17th edition. So this is back in the 1920s. Um, the Act of Settlement affirms that the laws of England of the birthright of the people thereof, and all the kings and queens who shall ascend the throne of this realm, ought to administer the government of the same according to the said laws, and all their officers and ministers ought to serve them respectively according to the same. The succession to the Crown Act, 1707, declared it high treason for anyone to maintain by affirming, uh, uh, affirm by writing, printing, or preaching that the kings or queens of this realm by and with the authority of Parliament, are not able to make laws and statutes of sufficient force and validity to limit and bind the crown. And the dissent, limitation, inheritance, and government thereof. So that's what we really want to see if we want to know whether there's some limitations. There's a statute that said if you said that it wasn't the case, you could be done for treason. It was an anti-Jacobite statute. Uh, most of that was in force, uh, I think, in 1953, when uh, uh, Elizabeth uh, swore her accession declaration oath, which we're coming to. Um, but this is a line portrait from about 1820 that a, a friend picked up on eBay. And you can see what it is. It's the reading of the Declaration of Rights to William and Mary. And it's a celebratory document made for the Earl of Huntington, which was rather a nice find on eBay for a fiver. Um, so I have that line print. Now, when the queen uh, ascends the throne, like any other monarch, um, they have to swear in a an oath in accordance with the uh, Bill of Rights. 
and an adjustment was actually made to that by the 1910 Accession Declaration Act. Um, and under the terms of that act, this is the oath. I, Elizabeth, do solemnly and sincerely in the presence of God profess, testify, and declare that I am a faithful Protestant and that I will, according to the true intent of the enactments which secure the Protestant succession to the throne, uphold and maintain the said enactments to the best of my powers according to law. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, to the best of my powers to uphold and maintain um, and according to law. Um, I will, uh, according to the true intent of the enactments, which secure the Protestant succession to the throne. Well, what could those enactments be? Well, the Coronation Oath Act is obviously one of them. The Bill of Rights is another, the Act of Settlement. The Act of Union with Scotland, that's another one. And interestingly, that says there shall be only one Parliament of Great Britain. And that is still on the statute book. Um, so there it is. Um, and then she says that there will be, a, to, she's agreed that they will uphold and maintain them, uh, the enactments, to the best of my powers according to the law. Well, the best of the Crown's powers are refusal of royal assent. It is, after all, uh, an assent. Force of arms, halting of trials, pardon, dissolution of, of parliament, and so on. Um, she has very special powers, as we can see, which our regular politicians don't hold. Um, they are in her remit. So the next thing is, well, what did the law say about this agreement? Well, the Bill of Rights was on the statute book, uh, and when she signed that document, it was certainly fully enforced, and still this bit still, still is. And it's very interesting because the bit that relates to the rights that the Declaration of Rights gave us um, said this, and they, the people, do claim, demand, and insist upon all and singular the premises as their undoubted rights and liberties, and that no declarations, judgments, doings, or proceedings to the prejudice of the people in any of the said premises ought to be taken into consequence or example. Well, think about that, consequence or example. That is saying that this Bill of Rights is for the people's liberty. It's not like other enactments. Normally, the judge's responsibility is for a very narrow interpretation of law. But when it came to the liberty of the subject, exactly the reverse is required. And you can read it there. That's what it's saying. Um, nothing to be taken into consequence example. In other words, there cannot be precedent set against this document. And then the Bill of Rights as I explained, it cites the whole of the declaration, and it then goes on saying, for the ratifying, confirming, and establishing the said declaration, and the articles, clauses, and matters, and things therein contained by the force of a law, made in due form by authority of parliament, do, may, do pray that it may be declared and enacted that all and singular, the rights and liberties asserted and claimed in the said declaration are the true, ancient, and indutable rights and liberties of the people of this kingdom. And listen to this bit. And so shall be esteemed, allowed, adjudged. That's a terrific word, because the judges say they don't have authority to overturn any act of parliament. Well, here's parliament's very own authority for anything that goes in consequence or example against it to be thrown out. So that's very important. Shall be esteemed, allowed, adjudged, deemed and taken to be. So there you have the words. It's very interesting. And that is what the law said. So if we then um, revert to the document again, um, you can see that uh, she has to uphold the powers to the best uh, of my powers according to law. Well, that bit says that it's for all time to come. That is not repealed. That is on the statute book. If you get a copy of the Bill of Rights or look it up on the internet, you'll find it all in place. Now, Magna Carta's 800th birthday, I took the opportunity of uh, picking up with my MP again and decided to ask uh, Mr. Cameron um, if he would confirm the meaning of this oath. And my MP decided that it would be best delegated to Mr. John Penrose, um, who was the Parliamentary Secretary uh, for Constitutional Affairs. And after a number of letters, I finally extracted this from them. They tried to dismiss it, and uh, I then pointed out the details of it, and they finally said, finally, Mr. Bringley is absolutely right to recognize the importance of the Coronation Oath Act and the Accession Declaration Act 1910 
and we agree that they do oblige the monarch to fulfill the legal obligations that are contained in them. Look at that, it's a we, so they had to defer to his cabinet committee for the answer. Um, I gave them a bit of a hard time there, I think. Um, anyway, um, to move on, our, one of our great uh, Earls of Chatham, uh, one of our Prime Ministers, um, recognising all these sort of dangers in the past, um, said this, which is wonderful words, instead of the arbitrary power of a king, we must submit to the arbitrary power of the House of Commons. If this be true, what benefit do we derive from the exchange? Tyranny, my lords, is detestable in every shape, but none so formidable as where it is assumed and exercised by a number of tyrants. <laughs> but, my lords, this is not the fact. This is not the Constitution. Uh, we have a law of Parliament, we have a statute book, and we have the Bill of Rights. So that's very interesting. Well, we're not quite there, but that's, we're nearly, nearly there. Um, so to weigh up on this, really, law defines that Parliament is, is not sovereign. Sovereignty resides in the Crown. That's what you would expect, isn't it? I mean, that's what all the law, the formal laws tell us. The Constitution gives supremacy to the law, not to Parliament. The coronation oath is, is the contract by which we must be governed. It secures the supremacy of the law over both Parliament and the Crown. Um, if you doubt that, look at the Parliament Acts that uh, engage them for fixed-term parliaments. They suddenly have to do that, don't they? So that they are bound by uh, certain laws. And the ones that we're talking about here are even more important because they determine what prerogative may be used for. Um, the Accession Declaration Oath further defines the limitations of the Crown to conform with specific laws. That's what it says. You've just seen them. Um, the rule of law defines that we live under a parliamentary system which has vital democratic elements. It is not democracy. Um, and the great benefit of this is that under a proper parliamentary system, the lawful minority will be protected. But as it is, with the democracy being used the way it is and with project fears, democracy can be used to annihilate virtually anything that they feel that is uh, antisocial um, or that becomes a matter of public concern. If you broke your oath in the armed forces in the First World War, you probably came to a pretty sticky end against a firing squad somewhere or another. Um, and many people died, and there, as we know, is our... Uh, memorial to the dead that fought uh, for these principles. I'm absolutely certain that in days gone by, uh, a lot of more of this sort of thing was taught at schools and people realized, realized it. You speak to your grandparents and so on, they'll tell you that Magna Carta forbid the um, taking of a man's tools of work from him uh, and many things like that, which were known. And so finally, we, we come to the last screen, uh, Sir Winston Churchill, and when in subsequent ages, the state, swollen with its own authority, has attempted to ride roughshod over the rights and liberties of the subject. It is to this doctrine that appeal has again and again been made, and never as yet without success. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry it's a, a real wham-bammer and uh, lots packed in there, but if you can take a, a tenth of it away, um, that would be terrific. Remember that you can find the Accession Declaration Oath um, if you look it up on the parliamentary websites under the heritage section or you look under the uh, first meeting of the first parliament, Elizabeth had to swear it in the throne in front of the Lords before she could even make her first speech. That's the condition. In other words, you, you are prerequisite. You're bound by this lot. And, and there it all is. So that's at least the theory of the rule of law. Um, what we've got today is um, sadly rather different. <laughs> Thank you very much.